You know, we're in the Hebrew month of Shavat, and this is when Tubishvat, the New Year of Trees, happens, and of course the almond tree of the testimony in my book that sprouted on Holy Mount Moriah at the time I was given the divine revelation and sent it to Jerusalem as the Lord had impressed in my heart to do immediately. Um, it was an incredible miracle that I talked about in my book and these miracles are still happening. You know, you just need to pay attention and pay attention to what God is speaking to your heart and saying to you. And I just wanted to talk about there's some things that happened on Tubishvat this year dealing with my mom and the almond tree sprouting and coming to life in Israel at the same time. The day that my mother was no longer here in bodily form just happened on Tubishvat. Okay, and the almond tree comes to life from the dead of winter and is resurrected to life for the spring. So this just happened on the day that my mother was cremated um, five years ago to the day, February 6th. Also, my almond tree testimony went out and it went somewhere very familiar to me where my mom was uh, raised and grew up and where I played as a child and where I was born down in Texas. So we're going to see what happens because God just put his stamp of approval on sending this testimony there and I will keep you updated on that. But remember when I told the story about the uh, firewood that was for sale on either side of the double doors where you walk in the middle and on either side on either side of the door was almond wood firewood from California and I had told you that whole almond drum testimony from the orchards of the almond trees in California and because I could not go there of course God brought the wood to me and I was so shocked and I bought a box of the wood and I told you on the side of the box the name of the company was Lazaro. Well, first let me say that Penny Caldwell, you know, who discovered the split rock in Horeb with her husband Jim Caldwell, she immediately wrote to me and said, of course, reminding me that that firewood was representative of the holy menorah, which was based on an almond tree. And I had written all about it in my book about the holy menorah. And here God brought this firewood out of nowhere. So I bought this box of the almond wood and I have it with me with the name Lazaro on the side, which I told you I looked that up and it is another form of Lazarus. So not only is the almond tree the sign of the resurrection from death to life, from winter to spring, but it's also a lot more that I detail in my book, of course, which is so thick, but it's been extremely edited so that only the best of the best material is in there. So. The thing is, is that I was just watching some information about the shroud and as you know, the official shroud photographer Barry M. Schwartz had befriended me and used to call my house and we used to talk about the shroud. Um, Barry Schwartz supplied those photographs of the shroud for my book and Dr. Petra Soons provided the 3D images from the shroud from 3D encoded information that's within the linen on the shroud. So it's really a miracle. Uh, most people don't know this, but the image on the shroud is on the very top layer of the fabric and it's on 
pieces of thread that are one-tenth the size of a human hair. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I was really astonished when I was watching um, it was David Rolfe talking about the shroud and he was talking about Paolo de Lazari. <laughs> Think of Lazaro, Lazari, are you kidding? So this researcher that researched and did all kinds of scientific study on Jesus' burial shroud, his last name is Lazari, which is another form of Lazarus, which is another type and shadow of the resurrection. So, so you've got this scientific mind that's researching the ultraviolet light on the Shroud of Turin and many other things, and he's representing in his name the resurrection of Lazarus, which Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So it's another incredible almond tree sign of the resurrection. And there's just another incredible thing that I just ran across. Now, the Hebrew month of Shavuot is considered the 11th month on the Hebrew calendar, and Shavuot means rod. And of course, my book is the Almond Tree, Aaron's Rod, the Messiah, King of Israel, and dealing with the rod of God. So we are in that month that means rod and God's divine presence is kind of manifested with power in this month. It was the month when Moses stood looking across at the promised land preparing the people to cross over into the promised land. And of course they were going back into the place that had been the former of Garden of Eden and so, you know, here we are, we're waiting to cross over into the paradise-like state to be uh, transformed in our bodies into an eternal state, and we're getting ready to cross over, and as Jeremiah said, as I said at the end of my book, God is watching over his word to perform it. This is what happened when Jeremiah saw the rod of an almond tree. God gave me a rod of an almond tree. And also Jim and Penny Caldwell, which I talk about at the end of my book. Um, a miracle happened with them with that. And they have rods of the almond tree from holy Mount Sinai. So mine on my book is from holy Mount Moriah. So all of this comes together in an incredible story. But what I want to show today is that they recently discovered this shipwreck from this ancient Danish king that the ship sank in about 1495. And they recently have discovered all of these ancient spices they discovered all kinds of things like guns and uh, crossbows. Um, I think they found cannons. But I'll read the articles to you. And they found drinking vessels. But the within this shipwreck, they found all of these ancient spices, including saffron and ginger. But what really blows my mind is right now in the month of Shavuot, when we celebrated Tu B'Shvat, which celebrates the first tree to blossom in Israel, the almond tree, would you believe they found almonds and their shells in the cargo of this vessel of this king? And this is being revealed in the month of Shavuot. Just the fact that they're reporting this story in the month of Shavuot is so significant, showing these almonds and their shells from 1495 that was aboard this ship. So let me just share the story because I just think this is <laughs> another divine miracle of God where he's just showing himself left and right and revealing his power 
and his testimony. So his testimony is going forward right now. And I'm just praying to God for divine blessing over this. This was posted in Newsweek by Aristos Giorgioli on February 9th, 2023. And uh, it's titled Shipwreck, a 500-year-old floating castle found to contain Thrilling Hall. I thought that the title shouldn't have really said floating castle because it's, it's a shipwreck that's down on the seabed floor. And it basically was stated that because the king kind of used this ship as a, his castle and lived and dwelt there and then the ship sank so let me tell you this story it says the 500 year old shipwreck of a medieval European king's personal floating castle has been found to contain a thrilling haul of exceptionally well preserved plant materials including exotic spices originating from the far-flung corners of the world. Maritime archaeological excavations conducted at the wreck of the 115-foot-long vessel Gribschunden, once the flagship of the Danish monarch King Hans, have revealed a huge array of food items. Many were luxuries accessible only to the elite at the time. Researchers have described it as an unprecedented discovery. The finds, documented in a study published in the journal PLOS-1, provide a unique window into the lives of the Northern European nobility in the late Middle Ages. These are the origins of today's truly globalized world. The discovery includes extravagant artifacts that have rarely or never been seen before in an archaeological context. Brendan Foley, an author of the study from the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History at Lund University, Sweden, told Newsweek, this is perhaps the most thrilling haul of spices from a shipwreck because of its age, quality of the plant remains, exotic, expensive spices, and the remarkable state of preservation. Beyond shipwrecks, this is certainly among the most fabulous discoveries of spices in any archaeological context on land or sea, Foley said. The Royal Danish warship Gribschunden was built in 1485 and essentially served as the mobile seat of government for King Hans. Hans used this artillery-carrying warship to stitch together his widespread kingdom, Foley said. It was quite literally his floating castle. Not just a warship, Gribschunden was an instrument of economic power, a social and cultural center, and also the focus of administrative and political functions of government. 
The first generation of a new style of vessel, Gribschunden, was characterized by a fusion of Mediterranean and Northern European shipbuilding traditions, replete with 11 iron cannons and room for 150 people on board. The vessel was very similar to the ships sailed by 15th century's explorers such as Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus. It's our best look at what those ships must have been like, Foley said. It's a well-preserved example of the enabling technologies that led to European domination of the planet after 1492. But despite its technological advances, the ship was struck by misfortune in 1495, sinking to its present watery grave in the Baltic Sea. The special circumstances of its last voyage add unique historical context to the latest findings. Just before midsummer in June of that year, Gribschilden set sail from King Hans' capital of Copenhagen, Denmark, with the monarch aboard. The ship anchored off Stora Ekun, Great Oak Island, located off the southeastern coast of what is now Sweden. Hans disembarked, likely accompanied by courtiers, noblemen, and soldiers. The king and his retinue were traveling to a political summit in Kalmar, Sweden, to negotiate with Sten Sturr the Elder. Sturr had effectively ruled Sweden since leading a successful rebellion against Danish-led forces in 1471. He wanted his state to break away from the Kalmar Union. This had joined the three Nordic kingdoms, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, together under a single monarch in 1397. Hans was hoping that through negotiations he could restore the Union under Danish rule and convince the Swedes to accept his role as leader of the three kingdoms. In service of his goal, Hans wanted to impress the Swedish delegation, demonstrate the power and wealth of his kingdom, and discourage independence efforts. To do this, Hans carried with him all manner of power displays, his warships, shipboard artillery, a battalion of professional soldiers, and small arms, including crossbows and gunpowder weapons, the authors of the study wrote. Buttressing these hard power elements were soft power signifiers, coinage, artwork, splendid livery, not to mention exotic food delicacies. Exotic spices were status markers among the aristocracy in Scandinavia and around the Baltic Sea during the Middle Ages, the study authors wrote. But while the king was ashore, an explosion struck the ship. It burned down and sank to the bottom of the seabed, killing many of those who were still on board. To make matters worse for Hans, when he finally made it to Kalmar, Sten Sturr did not even turn up for the meeting, leaving the status of the Union up in the air. The wreck of the Gribschunden was rediscovered by sport scuba divers in the 1960s and 70s between 2000 and 2012 maritime archaeologists recovered a number of artifacts during excavations. After a hiatus of several years, a new research initiative was launched in 2019 and explorations continued into 2020 and 21. Among the most notable finds from the dives in 2019, previously documented in a study published in the Journal of Archaeological Science, reports on which Foley was an author, is a wooden barrel containing the well-preserved remains of a butchered Atlantic sturgeon fish. This would have been highly valuable at the time as a food item. But nothing could have prepared the authors of the latest PLOS study for what they were going to find, a haul of exceptionally well-preserved plant materials, many from distant parts of the globe. They represented 40 species including cereals, oil seeds, fruits, vegetables, spices, and even a plant used for medicinal purposes. And Tubishvat is the time of planting fruit trees, and they're talking about finding these fruits, including the almond seeds and the almond hulls aboard the ship. Among the finds were plants consumed as flavorings, such as saffron, 
cloves, ginger, peppercorns, mustard, caraway, and dill. Others eaten as snacks are used in baking. Almonds, hazelnuts, blackberries, raspberries, grapes, and flax. And some that could be eaten as part of a meal, cucumber. The grapes could have been consumed as raisins, the authors wrote. The plant remains were found in various forms, including seeds, fruits, nutshells, flower parts, and whole spices, the study shows. And all of that's representative of the new year of trees. You've got the seeds, the fruits, the holes, the nutshells, the flower parts, <laughs> all representing Shavat. <laughs> I just think this is amazing. In the field, we knew that we had something special the moment the exotic spices appeared in the excavation, Foley said, and the saffron was obvious. Nothing else looks like it. We also could see peppercorns in the excavated material. We expected there would be more, but we needed the expertise of an excellent ar archaeobotanist. Fortunately, Mikhail Larson sits in the office one floor away from my office, and he was willing to conduct the detailed analysis of the sediment samples we collected from the wreck. Foley said that there had been no indications previously that exotic spices would be found on the shipwreck. It was completely unexpected, except that we have come to know we should always expect the unexpected with a shipwreck. The sturgeon find in 2019 was an indication that Gribschunden was carrying elite foods, but we didn't foresee the assortment and volume of spices we ultimately encountered. The only non-edible plant that researchers identified was henbane. The researchers found only one henbane seed on the ship, so it's not clear if the plant was carried for medicinal purposes or if it accidentally found its way into the other food supplies. Foley said that the discovery of all the exotic species surprised the research team, with many of them having no archaeological precedent. Clove, saffron, ginger have never been found in excavations of medieval northern European sites. Foley added, the volume of the spices was another surprise. We recovered more than 400 milliliters of saffron. That's an enormous amount and would have been enormously expensive. It still is today. In case you don't know what saffron is, it's like the little fuzzy uh, stamen inside the crocus flower. And it's got a distinct kind of orange-yellow color. And they use it as a spice in foods. The team found records of King Hans buying saffron in these volumes again and again, spending the equivalent of nearly a year's salary for a senior officer on Grimstuden just on the spice. Larson, the co-author of the study, said this is the first saffron discovery from an archaeological site anywhere in the world. This is an unprecedented find, he told Newsweek. The clove discoveries were equally amazing, Foley said. It grew in only one place in eastern Indonesia, very nearly the other side of the planet from Denmark and Sweden. It springs a host of questions about the trade and supply chain from the Malakas, an archipelago in the east of Indonesia to the Baltic. The exceptional preservation state of the plant materials, some of which even feature Fruit, flesh, and skin can be explained by the peculiar environment of the Baltic Sea. It is characterized by low salinity and frigid temperatures. The saffron is amazing. It is still brightly colored, and it still smells like saffron, albeit with more than a hint of mud, Foley said. The latest findings have a number of implications, according to the researchers, not least because they provide a clear look into the world of the elite in medieval northern Europe. 
We see that King Hans and his social circle not only consume these expensive delicacies, Hans also used the spices to demonstrate his wealth and global connections, Foley said. The consumption of large quantities of imported delicacies was one way Hans could use soft power to convince the Swedes to accept his rule. We also see from these spices the beginnings of the first true period of globalization, he said. Beginning in the late 1400s, the entire planet becomes connected in a way it never had been before. It's the launch of the modern world, and a lot of it is due to the new class of ships like Gribschunden. Goods are traded and people are communicating across previously unimaginable distances. Then we have another article by HeritageDaily.com about this shipwreck. Underwater archaeologists have made new discoveries at the Gribschunden shipwreck, the flagship of John, King of Denmark. The Gribschunden was a Dutch warship which sank in 1495 in the Baltic Sea off the coast of Ronneby, Sweden. The first mention of the ship is in a letter written by King John in 1486, which reads, In nostra griffone, Latin for, in our ship, griffin. So the griffin was the figurehead, you know, the head that sticks out on the front of the bow of the ship. While anchored in a natural arbor near the port of Ranby, the Gribschunden mysteriously caught fire and sunk, an event which was recorded in the contemporaneous Swedish Styrre Kuninkan, the Styr Chronicle, and in two German sources, Rimar Koch's Lübeck Chronicle and Kaspar Weinreich's Danzig Chronicle. A diving club first discovered the wreck in the 1970s at a depth of 33 feet. But unaware of the significance, the identity of the wreck wouldn't be confirmed until 2013. The wreck is internationally significant as the world's best preserved ship from the age of exploration, a proxy for the vessels of Christopher Columbus and Vasco de Garna. As part of a study conducted by underwater archaeologists from Lund University, Blekinga Museum, and the Danish Viking Ship Museum, the researchers have recovered artillery, handguns, and major components of the steering gear and stern castle. No other ship from the time of exploration has survived this intact, says scientific leader Brendan Foley from the Lund University. Gribschunden delivers new insights into those voyages. We now understand the actual size and layout of those ships that changed the world. Lund University PhD candidate Paolo de Rudis and Viking Ship Museum specialist Mikhail Thompson combined 3D models of the artillery, rudder, tiller, and keel to recreate the stern castle. This is the section of the ship the king and the nobleman likely occupied in addition to gunners and steermen. In the bow of the ship, 3D models of the stern post and hawse pieces through which the anchor lines passed provide clues about the forecastle's functions of crew accommodation, ship handling, and fortification. Ironically, I wrote something about the Hawes house in my book, where these anchor lines pass through. Amazing connection. Another big puzzle remains, what really caused Gribschunden to sink? Foley asked, medieval documents state that there was a fire and an explosion, 
but we have not seen any signs of that. Maybe next year's excavation will provide evidence of the catastrophe. Now let me just read this from Crayford.c. Kriebschund and Shipwreck, a short report from the 2019 excavation. Around midsummer 1495, one of the largest and most technologically advanced warships in northern Europe caught fire, exploded, and sank. The disaster occurred off Stars Eskun near Ronneby, the Blinkinga region. I hope I'm saying those words right. The ship was Gribschunden Griffendog, flagship of the Danish king Hans. Built in 1485 along the river Musa in northern France, Belgium, or the Netherlands, the ship had a long career in Hans' service. The king sent her as far abroad as England and perhaps Greenland. He sailed on the vessel regularly, and he was aboard the ship for its final voyage. When lost, Gribschunden and an accompanying squadron were en route to Kalmar, carrying Hans and his court to a political summit. The goal of the meeting was to reestablish the Kalmar Union, uniting the entire Nordic region under a single ruler in a novel political entity and nation-state. The king amassed on his flagship everything and everyone to impress the Swedish noblemen waiting at Kalmar. Contemporary accounts report that the king ordered the ship's deep hold to be loaded with extravagant food and drink for days of lavish feasting. His soldiers prepared for a show of arms, equipped with the latest gunpowder weapons. On the ship's decks, members of the royal court peacocked in their finest clothing. Among the entourage was the royal astronomer, also known as Star Watcher or Matematico. If the chronicles can be believed, his foreboding prophecy convinced the king to leave the doomed ship before the conflagration, thus saving his life. The accidental fire that sank the ship was a calamity for Hans. It killed some number of influential people, consumed valuable goods, and diminished the king's prestige. The disaster contributed to a two-year delay in recreating a precarious Kalmar Union. Griebschunden was one of the earliest European naval vessels armed with guns. The vessel's style was cutting edge for the time and big at about 32 meters in length. She was a new amalgamation of northern European and Mediterranean architecture, a fusion of disparate styles and building techniques. Ships like this were the enabling technology for global voyages, exploration, and conquest. Parts of Gribschunden standing above the waves are visible in the shallow water undoubtedly were salvaged in 1495 and soon after. Then portions of the upper structure disintegrated and fell to the sea floor. The ship settled into the soft sediments of the Baltic and slowly silt infilled and buried much of what was left. Out of sight, the ship and her history were soon out of mind. She lay forgotten until the 1970s. Can you believe that? Wow. When Swedish sports scuba divers found the wreck, they scavenged small finds that hinted at its identity. Golf ball sized lead cannonballs, bits of wooden crossbow bolts, fragments of ceramic and metal objects, the old wreck in the shallow protected waters behind Stora Ekron became a backup dive site, a place to go when the seas were too rough elsewhere. The local diving community knew the wreck well, but its name remained a mystery. In 2001, the wreck's peculiar features drew the divers' attention. They informed Kalmar Museum and Lundström Releasing Blinkenja that the site held the remains of early naval gun carriages. A two day dive by archaeologists later that year was confirmed, and the historical significance of these artifacts and the wreck itself. In Furschvar Schlagskolan, historian Ingvar Schlumblum 
tentatively identified the ship as Gribschenden. Over the next years, a series of brief and limited interventions kindled curiosity, especially when archaeologists discovered the ship's grotesque figurehead of the griffin dog eating an unfortunate soul. Wow. You know, the griffin is also on the flag of Wales. That's the dragon, the red dragon, that was on the back of Prince Charles's chair at his investiture as Prince of Wales. Um, so I won't go into that, but this griffin is the same deal here. And the 2019 excavation, interest in the ship swelled in 2018 when a consortium of Swedish and some Danish institutions formed to propel its study with funding from Griffjord Foundation. The first extensive excavation campaign took place in late summer of 2019. Over three weeks, an international team of maritime archaeologists mapped the wreck in exquisite precision with photogametry and excavated a six by two meter trench in the middle of the ship. Less than one percent of the ship's wreck's total area. At Lund University, a dozen researchers from different scientific fields launched an interdisciplinary study of all the artifacts raised since the 1970s, and the results of this comprehensive investigation highlight not only aspects of the nautical archaeology, but also of Hans' attempt to build a new nation-state at the end of the medieval period. Within the first hours of the excavation, the artifact deposit proved its richness. Objects with no archaeological precedent emerged. First came the wooden handle of a dagger, then the wooden stock of a crossbow, and not far from it the wooden stock of an arquebus, a type of early handgun. Alongside the arquebus nestled the bolt of a long arrow, probably loaded in the gun at the time of sinking. Anaerobic bacteria living in the sediments consumed all of the iron components of these weapons, but the recesses and through holes in the stalks indicate the positions of the vanished fittings. These provide enough information to inform working replicas of each piece. Combined with the main battery of guns, the shipwreck yielded the entire range of late medieval weapons. Gribschunden was on a diplomatic mission not a military campaign, but the variety of weapons we recovered from a very small excavation trench proved that the ship was full of men-at-arms and their equipment. Hans surely intended to hold a military review in Kalmar to display the power of his forces alongside his prized vessel. In his bid to unify the Nordic region, the threat of violence backstopped negotiation and persuasion. A scant two meters from the weapon's locus, we uncovered a particularly evocative cluster of small finds. Hundreds of copper rings linked together sat atop a badly degraded pile of iron oxide. These are the remains of a suit of chainmail armor. Wow, that's cool. The copper links established the cuffs, collar, and waist of an iron mail shirt. So it was chainmail. Within this rust-stained silt lay a small copper ring. Barely discernible through the tarnish, raised symbols hinted that this may be the maker's mark of the armor. I have just been talking about the maker's mark of the king and how the royal cipher is the maker's mark. 
And God put his maker's mark on us because he's our maker. And those who take the mark of the beast will take this earthly king's maker mark. This is unbelievable. So the maker's mark was found in this shipwreck. And, of course, they used to put the maker's mark on, you know, barrels that contained, um, you know, the, the alcohol and wine and beer and all of those things. So they would also put the maker's mark on furniture. It would have the stamp of the company on it. But the stamp of the king is the maker's mark. And um, it says... I mean, this is just amazing how it coincides with things I've talked about. Not having to do with the shipwreck, though. Barely discernible through the tarnish, raised symbols hinted that this may be the maker's mark of the armor. A hunch later confirmed by x-ray imaging. Maker's marks from medieval chain mail are extraordinarily rare. And this is the only example known from an archaeological source. Remarkably, the name of the armorer, Ulrich Führer, is listed in a 1416 census of Nuremberg as a maker of fine and expensive chain mail. Wow! Dating to 1416. This is so exciting. Either the valuable armor was decades old when its owner carried it on the Grubschunden, or successive generations of Hürers carried on the family business. A suit of chain mail of this quality would have been beyond the budget of a common soldier. It was probably owned by a nobleman or a senior mercenary. Totally amazing. Let's have a look. And the caption underneath those pictures said, Maker's Mark Ring as recovered and radiograph revealing the name of the maker. Unbelievable. Armorer Ulrich Führer lived in Nuremberg in early to mid 1400s. This image was credited to Max Jotterhorn. Nearby artifacts provided more evidence of the owner's elite social status. A purse filled with metal consecration about the size of a man's thumb rested centimeters from the chain mail. We recognized a few loose objects in the purse as silver coins. At Lund University, we made a digital 3D model of the coin purse using a structured light scanner. From that digital file, we 3D printed a physical copy in nylon. At the Danish Technical University's 3D Imaging Center, we CT scanned the mass and revealed that it holds more than 120 silver coins. Within the oxidized crust, the coins are well preserved. The CT data showed both faces of several coins. Comparison to coins in the study collection at the Blenkinga Museum determined that these are Danish Havid coins minted in Alborg and Malmö during Hans' reign. And this is the only known coin hoard from a context definitely associated with that monarch who minted them. So let's just have a look at the purse and then the plastic model uh, made with a 3D printer and 
when they x-rayed inside the purse, they showed the type of coin that was minted at that time. The silver coin during Hans' reign, the king of Denmark. The monetary value of this cash is difficult to estimate because 15th century records are scarce, but one 1495 account shows a crossbow that sold for 60 hvid. This diminutive purse of coins weighed only 100 grams but certainly was a fair amount of wealth. That it was abandoned indicates that the owner either fled in a terrible panic or perished on the burning ship. In either case, this small artifact presents a stark picture of the ship's final moments. Other objects recovered from the wreck demonstrate Han's plans for a fancy table upside down in the hold and obscured among several intact wooden casks in a wicker basket. We found a completely intact wooden tankard. At the time of discovery, its lid was still in place, making the jar airtight. It was so full of gas from the decomposition of its contents, it nearly popped to the surface like a balloon. After tipping out the gas, we safely recovered the tankard. Chemical and a DNA analysis of the residues within may reveal a 524-year-old tipple. This remarkable drinking vessel was milled and carved from a single block of alder wood and perhaps was stained red. The tankard from Gribschunden is emblazoned with a crown-like symbol. Could it be the mark of Hans himself? No doubt. Gripschunden's hold delivered a tangible bounty of history. Intact wooden barrels bear witness to the disrupted Kalmar feast. Beef and mutton bones, beer kegs and casks holding the remains of a two meter long sturgeon. A DNA and osteological study conducted at Lund University proved that this huge fish was an Atlantic sturgeon, perhaps caught during the voyage and inexpertly butchered. The Danish beach law dictated that all sturgeons were the property of the king, the meat and roe perhaps reserved for his table, while the various organs such as the swim bladder for glue making and other industrial processes. The wooden barrels themselves are as interesting as their contents. Dendrochronology allows us to determine the date the trees were cut and the location where they grew. Combined with chemical and molecular analysis of their contents, barrels from Baltic shipwrecks offer an entirely untapped source of information about the medieval and early modern political economy of Europe. Half a millennium after the blaze that paradoxically destroyed and preserved the ship, Gripschunden has sparked the imaginations of a wide range of researchers. International interest is now focused on this ship and the archaeological project funded by Crefeud Foundation. It is also the subject of an international documentary film to be broadcast in North America. That was in autumn of 2020. The finds conveyed here are mere highlights from a single campaign. More than 99% of the wreck is still unexcavated and unexplored. As the project continues, we expect to find the sea chests of the nobleman and the king 
full of fine clothing and luxury personal possessions. Although the historical written sources are mute on the subject, it is possible that archaeology will reveal the presence of women aboard the ship, perhaps the medicine kit of the doctor or curiosities of the stargazer. Alchemist await discovery. The structure of this hull and upper works will showcase the ship of discovery as a technological achievement, while the internal layout of the ship and physical spaces occupied by the various ranks of men aboard will demonstrate the origins of today's naval traditions. As an example of the process of building a modern nation state, no other site can compare to Gribschunden. This shipwreck is poised to become the world's premier maritime archaeology project Project, thanks to support from the Crefude Foundation. Dr. Brendan Foley, Principal Investigator, Department of Archaeology and Ancient History, Lund University. Krefurtska Stiftelsen. So let me just conclude this astonishing discovery with the meaning of the crocus flower from which the saffron comes that they found in abundance. The crocus symbolizes rebirth in a never-ending cycle of life. It signals the arrival of spring, the promise of new beginning. And it's the time of Tubishvat, the time of renewal, the arrival of spring, the never-ending cycle of life as the trees come back from the dead of winter and the almond is the first to flower and these almonds were preserved on this ship from 1495 with the shells. Um, the other day on Tubishvat I planted almond seeds. We'll see what happens. But something extraordinary did happen on Tubishvat, the New Year of Trees this year, and when something is developed from it, I will let you know more of the story. And let me just say right here that I used to take my little angel kitty cat out to notice that the crocuses were like the first ones coming up out of the ground at our former home. And I would take my kitty out there and I would say to him, the crocuses are blooming. And I'd put him right down right in front of it, and he would lean forward, and he would always go like he was smelling the crocuses. So it's a time of the arrival of spring, the time of rebirth, and so is Tu B'Shvat, the new year of trees in Israel. It's a time that spring is arriving, and the sap is beginning to flow into the dormant winter trees, giving a resurrection of life to the trees. So this situation on Tubishvat, dealing with my mother once again, and I had the eve of Tubishvat, the viewing of my mom, and one of my almond blossoms opened that she had seen that I took pictures into her hospital bed and I showed her all of the buds on the tree. It was the most buds there ever were on it. So um, I put them in with her. I dried them and put half with me, half with her. So she knew the story about the almond tree. She knew my testimony. And God just keeps doing things at the time of Tubishvat. And I did not plan these things out. To find out that this Lazaro on my almond wood and the guy working on the resurrection of Jesus, the Shroud of Turin, is Lazari. And I've got Lazaro on the box, both speaking of Lazarus and his resurrection by Jesus. It's incredible. So I thought the month of Shavad the time of Tu B'Shvat is the time to tell this story that these almonds were found on this ship from 1495 with all the fruits and spices and everything that were preserved for, you know, about 500 years. 
And let me just say one more thing, that the crocus is associated with St. Valentine. The story of that is that one of the Romans who had thrown St. Valentine in jail told him that he would convert if he could cure his daughter's blindness. St. Valentine wrote a note to the man's daughter, gave it to the jailer, and claimed he would convert, and requested that the man give the letter to his daughter. When she opened the note, she saw the note read from your valentine and saw that there was a yellow crocus flower inside. Miraculously, her eyesight was restored and was as good as new. The crocus flower symbolizes the cheerfulness, joy, and happiness that the daughter and the father felt after restoring her sight. So now I started out this video talking about that we are in the Hebrew month of Shavuot. And Shavuot means the rod, and it is the time of rejuvenation, rebirth, um, the time where the sap starts to flow into the trees, they start to come to life, they start to be resurrected from the dead of winter. So one of the things on the shipwreck, as you recall, is all the saffron, which comes from the crocus flower. and how incredible is the meaning of the crocus? It's also known as the Easter flower and has long been associated with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So incredibly, not only is the almond tree symbolic of the time of Tu B'Shvat, the New Year of Trees in Israel, which is all in my book, and the crocus is a harbinger of spring symbolizing the triumph of life over death. It's eagerly awaiting emergence from its snowy tomb and is a cause for joy throughout our winter weary land. The crocus has long been associated with resurrection and more specifically within Christianity the resurrection of Jesus the climax of the greatest story ever told. Mindful of the crocus, the prophet Isaiah, when looking forward to the advent of the Messiah, penned these verses in anticipation of the peace that the Messiah would bring to the world. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. And... It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. That's Isaiah 35, 1 through 2. It says that when the Messiah comes, the world which is often dry and full of death will become a place of abundant life. It will be resurrected into its glory. The crocus is the first flower to bloom near the end of winter, often emerging through late winter snows and it is the first sign of new life before spring arrives. It's a hopeful sign of life when most of the world is still frozen and gray and dormant like in a dead state. Isaiah was given the great foresight to tell his audience of the Messiah's coming and also showed how the Messiah would begin to restore life and hope to people plagued by death and despair. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. And here Isaiah moves from general prophecies of reassurance and hope to a list of four miracles that will verify who the Messiah is. And, and Jesus gave sight to the blind, the lame walked, and the deaf heard. We see this in Matthew 11, 2 through 5. Considering its eternal significance, like the crocus midwinter bloom in a desert wasteland, Jesus' earthly ministry demonstrated that God's return to his creation brings about life and healing for those whom he touches. He resurrects the dead 
and he transfigures our mortal bodies to immortality and gives us a glorified body and those who are dead will rise from their graves and go up to meet the king face to face this is a meaning of the crocus it's the meaning in the almond tree and we are in Shavat when winter turns to spring in Israel all of these things should just thrill you and the sign of all the saffron being the crocus stamens that are <laughs> preserved from 1495 and these almonds being in the shipwreck as well is amazing to me as well as the wood that they were able to tell what forest it came from and when it was cut down is just mind-blowing so here we are you know just after the new year of trees in Israel and behold the fig tree and all the trees when they bud you know that summer is near even at the door the king is coming and he's giving all of his miraculous signs in these things stay tuned because there's so much more that I have to tell you and you're gonna be amazed at the glory of the Lord in this story.